All right. So our next group, um, Andreas, Jonathan, Bob. All right. So take those three up there. All right, so uh, one of the things that we want to talk about um, was our build data. Uh, it's sort of fundamental to any engine tools infrastructure. Um, and, you know, looking at, um, you know, scaling up games and AAA games, right? I mean, this is a this is a big problem, right? You have more and more data and more and more stuff to build and deal with. So how do we de deal with it for ourselves, I thought might be an interesting question. So let me introduce each person. Um, um, Jonathan Adam Chesky uh, is a good senior morning. engine programmer on. Sorry, I said good morning. <laughs> <laughs> is a senior engine programmer on the Syndicate team. Um, Bob Sprenthal is an engine programmer on now the rendering team, um, but did a lot of the initial work on our build system and builders and uh, um, architecture around the area while he was on the Syndicate team or what was previous previous team to that. Um, and you've already met. Uh, Andreas, uh, lead of the syndicate team. Um, so let's start out. I mean, I think Bob, you've you know been in sort of the build system more than really anyone um, in terms of its you know design, architecture, um, and handling um, of the builders and the the cache system and everything like that. So can you give us sort of a brief overview of of what the broad architecture is? Sure. So the general goal of the build system is to be kind of this invisible thing that transforms data from a content creation tool to something that can load up into our engine. Um, we, by invisible, I mean it should happen very quickly and without anybody's intervention. Um, so the way it's set up, we have builders to transform our different asset types. So we have things like you know textures, models, zones, um, and so our every every um, asset type has its own custom builder. Yep, yeah, it, and um, for each asset, we invoke the builder once. Um, the reason is As opposed to? As opposed to like, you know, we're gonna build this zone, let's invoke this one executable once, and it's gonna go through all the different things, all the textures, all the models, whatever. Or we're gonna keep something running all the time that we're gonna push, here's a new asset, here's a new asset. Um, the reason is because we just want it to be easy to reproduce bugs, essentially. Um, if you have something that's always running or is running on a huge set of data, then it's very hard to get back to the point where this specific bug happened. And you know, I'd like to say that, oh yeah, the builders are reliable, but <laughs> stuff happens. Right. So you can kind of think of it as sort of a compiler model, right? Yeah. You get some, you know, you just you're just building this one input and spitting out some output, right? For right. Yeah. Exactly. Um, the job of the build system is really to figure out when to invoke the different builders. Um, when a builder runs, it reports some dependency information. It says, uh, these are the files that I took as input. What's kind of interesting, I think, about our system is we don't really know those input files until after the builder has run, which is kind of different from like a normal code compiler. If you think about that, you probably know like you have some preprocessor that tells you, okay, the compiler's gonna need these things. In our system, we, um, we know an input, we don't know what else will be um, used by the builder. So the builder reports that back, the build system keeps track of that and uses it in the future in case any files change, we know what to invoke. So you, um, you give an input file, say a material, right? You build it, it spits out everything that it had to read during that process, right, right. as an output. Um, which then then fear sort of feeds back to the system to say these are now dependencies. So if any of these things change, rebuild it. Is that the idea? Yeah, exactly. Um, so how do we know what to build? That's something needs to be built in the first place. Um, well, we know every asset needs to be built, and we know what our assets are. We have X many models or whatever. Those all need to be built at some point. Um, so the build system in the background is just kind of churning away at these things. It says these models haven't been built yet. I better do that. Um, in addition, we have some way that we can prioritize things that are needed by the engine. So somebody will be running the game. They'll be loading into a particular level or whatever. And uh, we can figure out from that um, what different assets are needed as the engine requests them. All right. Um, so Jonathan, one of the, I think the challenges with 
with there's sort of the big fundamental decisions that you have to make when you're building a build system, right? Is a sort of global versus local um, transformation, right? That problem. Um, you want if fast. You want fast iteration time. You have to sort of focus on local transformations, right? I just build the material. I just build the the this model, right? That sort of thing, and not do these sort of big global. I need all the things in order to transform because that slows down your iteration time, right? Those huge mm -hmm. dependency trees. Um, so where does that fall down? In, our, in, in sort of real world terms in our <coughs> space, like where does that architecture just need to be broken and worked around? It, I, I think it falls down um, in, I, I guess, in the same way you were talking about uh, uh, design priorities earlier, where you have too little con context to reason about what it is you're producing to, to um, give something that's actually useful or solves the problem that it needs to later on. And so we, we do build textures individually, we do build our materials, our shaders individually, um, but we have a sort of container unit of placed game assets and other things, the, the zone files, are the, 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 the point at which, in reality, you need a lot of everything to be brought in, to be examined, and to, to, to be able to reason about it. Now, in uh, I ideal terms, you could say, well, here is a thing that just lists a bunch of references to other asset types, and we know that when the game loads, it can load this, it can load them, and it'll have everything it needs, and so we, we don't need to load them all at once when we're building the zone. In practice, we have uh, attributes on, say, an individual model or uh, an actor that's placed in the world that we do want to propagate into the zone so that when we instantiate that, we're able to get it right or, ch or make it cheaper to instantiate in the first place. And going beyond that, one of the, one of the um, problems we've had to wrestle with and don't have a good solution for yet is to say where we have a number of zones that represent the same physical space in the world so if we're making an open open world game with bits streaming in we have multiple zones so we'll have zone for the environment art we'll have zone for gameplay place things we'll have a zone for maybe audio or visual effects place things um, which works well for the production teams to to con construct that data um, but we then end up with a degree of duplication between those things of uh, assets that are referenced um, where we lack context about what else is around them. And so uh, as, as much as we want to build small self-contained things, I think one of the things I'm thinking about at least is in the future we may need to, uh, well, there may be sufficient advantage to batching those things together and building something else that represents a, a space in the world. Uh, as well. So there's, there's, there's trade-offs all the way through. Well, what you want is someone, someone who's working on a texture to be able to change the texture, see it in the game within uh, a few seconds where possible. Um, but what you also want is that in a, in a game where you've got a, a hero that's moving around at high speed, you can instantiate the, the, the data that represents the different parts of the world as quickly as possible. So there's always a balance and trade-off to be made in that space. Um, in particular, in your work, one of the things that, um, you know, has legitimately broken the rules for for big benefit and sort of how we work is navigation. So can you talk a little bit about how that's very different for in terms of processing? <coughs> navigation uh, to build our navigation mesh. Uh, so we use we use recast. We take the collision geometry of of the models that are placed in the world, the statically placed things, and we we take them all together and. Uh, it, it computes basically walkable surfaces, groups, triangles that, that represent where bots could stand or depending on what shape they are, whatever you know, thing they do. But um, you need to take all those zones together to reason about that. And in fact, it's, it's not, our data doesn't have constraints on it that say that uh, the zones for a particular part of the world contain only things in that part of the world. Big buildings may spill over, things may be placed in ways that, that it goes outside those boundaries. And we don't have the ability to reason from the outside uh, about what zones contain things that will influence what is walkable in this space. And so we end up having to load the entire, uh, the entire game, the entire, well, in, an entire level at once. Uh, and so um, for, again, a large open world, that, that's a lot of data. And um, it very much breaks that rule of looking at self-contained smaller things. We need, we need all the context to reason about. And so we, we put a lot of effort into making that as streamlined as possible. So rather than, uh, rather than consuming our source data, which is JSON text-based thing with a lot of indirection and, and um, 
a format that makes sense for editing and, and maintaining uh, histories of. We take the built data that the game would be consumed. We pick out the things we care about. Uh, it's already built in a format that's quick to load, and uh, we, we, can, we can load and build that world out quickly. Then we, we run uh, recast across that, across all the CPU, CPU cores we have available. And then we bake it back out, though, for an open world level in pieces the size of the individual tiles. So uh, we're then able to um, load just the necessary parts because for a, for a big level there's too much data there than uh, we want to spend on memory while that, that level is loaded. So different trade-offs. I, I think um, with the goal of iteration times, it falls down a lot at the moment. Uh, it's another thing I want to go back to and work out how we can make it run faster again. There's, there's opportunities there. Um, but it, it's, um, yeah, I, to, the, the important thing is that it's correct. And given the constraints, given the, the input data we have, it's hard to make it correct without having all the context. It's not possible to make it correct without having all that context there to, to build it. All right, Andreas, one of the, uh, I mean, I think in a similar subject, one of the, the challenges when we went to, say, Sunset Overdrive um, in this sort of big open world level um, is for just figuring out what's going to go on the disk and in what order, sort of managing streaming, right? Um, so well, how, what had to change about the infrastructure of our sort of built data and, and process in order to reason about um, mm -hmm. how we're going to build a disk? Well, I think the, the original premise of the engine was very much, um, it was set up to allow for fast prototyping. And I think Fuse was the first game we shipped on this generation of engine technology, and it was very much a last minute scramble. Uh, and so Sunset coming off of that, and um, we needed to do something better. And I think the one thing that helped the most is to prevent the engine from ever loading a single file. That's not a thing you can do. Like We deleted all the load this thing APIs, because you're never loading one thing. And as soon as you find all those places in your code that's like trying to do something clever with IO themselves, just remove them, because they're doing the wrong thing. And uh, the other thing we did was to say, well, whenever you're going to load something, you want everything that it references. And you know, we're having those realizations. Uh, I guess we're doing something that not a lot of engineers are doing, but we have a a global dependency graph of all our assets in memory at all times. So we can answer the question to say, if you need this, what do you also need? And we use that information offline. So when we build our archives, we use that information to duplicate things out on the drive uh, in what we call key asset groups. And I think that was a, um, we had done something very similar before, but this was like when we, uh, we had enough memory to do it, I guess, on, on current gen, because that thing is, uh, it compresses to five megs, but it's something like 30 or so in RAM. Like it's, we have a lot of tiny assets. And so, but it, it allows us to answer the question of, okay, I, I want to stream in these sets of tiles. And the, the thing is, our game's not static. You know, gameplay will enable things in the world and disable things in the world. And, you know, oh, you're on this mission and everything is red. Or like there's a fire truck and, you know, they have all these ways of combining content in surprising ways for engine developers. And so, given these things, what is the best possible load order we can come up with? And having this in memory database is kind of a novel way of doing that. And then they, they will request the top level things and we work out everything they can possibly need and pull it in. So that was part of what we did for Sunset. Uh, but I, I think the, removing the file abstraction at all, like we don't, there's no function that takes a file name in our engine. Mm. All you can talk about is a 64-bit asset ID. Um, this is it. And if you load an asset, you also always get the dependencies. Well, I mean, I think one of the things that, that you pointed out is that we have a lot of individual assets, right? That's not a small number. I mean, I know um, that someone recently broke a couple of our tools by check, trying to check in one single check-in with 500,000 new assets, right? Uh, yes. So, you know, we're dealing with a quite a large number of, of practical assets that, that, that are being created here. Um, so, yeah, we hit every limit, sort of file system limits, file length, you know, name limits, all these limits, right? Hash conflicts. Yeah, hash yeah. conflicts come up all the time. Um, so every limit, if there is one, you're going to hit it. So I think to take those things seriously when you're creating your systems, right, to understand that you will absolutely hit those limits and how you're going to manage it. Yeah, and I think that, I mean, to, to follow up on what I just said, I think it is very unique for the games we're building. Like, we were careful because we're also making level-based games. You know, if you play Edge of Nowhere, it's a traditional level-loading game. So we couldn't throw those out. 
right? But I think the solution we have is very appropriate to our company and the way you know we manage our data and how we you know. So I wouldn't be afraid to do that because I mean, would you agree that doing that sort of a system that fits the way we organize our data and build our games, rather than trying to use some off-the-shelf thing and shoehorn or, for example, on on uh, on platform we don't use FIOS at all. There's no need because we outperform FIOS, and that's we do that because we have that information. <coughs> All right, so <coughs> I want to um, forward a question um, that any of you could, could jump in on. Uh, how much does global opt opt how much does the global optimization um, bakes figure into the a the asset pipeline? Um, so I think this sort of this the heart of this question is sort of what we're talking about, sort of these these global understanding the global data problem, um, and um, is there anything else? Is there any other place where you know, it either is inhibiting us or we need to do something special. Um, yeah, well, I think that's been a challenge for us. Um, I mean, Jonathan talked about the way we build NAV, and that's kind of the separate thing from the way that almost everything else works. Um, I'm kind of guilty of that, too, because I recently introduced some lighting feature that is also a global bake because, hey, it was a lot easier to do that than try to shoehorn it into the way th the rest of our build system works. Um, I mean, it's a trade-off between I need some global thing because that's more optimal and I need little teeny pieces because that's a lot faster to build. So that's always something that we discuss when we're talking about creating some new data type. And it's, we've thought about how can we set up a system where it would work to, say, build nav just on the fly in the background all the time. And it, it's a difficult challenge. We haven't really gotten to the point where I think we need that right now, but um, that's why we have a, a different setup for certain things like NAV, because that's what works best for those. For many other things, we've been able to keep small little chunks, um, because that performs well enough for our games. And if I can add as well, I think one of the other trade-offs here is obviously that, that it provides sufficient value that it's worthwhile doing as a separate different type of step. The, the quality of our lighting, I think, is it's infeasible to do at runtime. Like you, we couldn't be building that data as the game is running. It's a fair, fair statement, right? Yeah. Yep. Um, so we do it as an offline step so we can get that level of quality, so we can achieve that, that, that standard. And the same, the same thing goes for the, the navigation mesh. It's more expensive than the price we want to pay at runtime. Um, it's sufficiently valuable that we do it as a separate external step. And we certainly, um, like we, we weigh up those choices as we go as well to say, like, it, could we come up with something good enough at runtime? Could we come up with something that, that, that is sufficient to solve the problem? And th there's often a lot of, well, say, hand-wringing on some of that stuff because we don't want to, I would say for the nav, nav stuff, if the separate nav builder didn't exist, I would be much happier. Um, it's one less separate thing that, that it, it has its own special path and, and special requirements that wouldn't need to run. It would then be in the engine being exercised every day by everyone who's running that. So there, there's distinct advantages to having it as part of the runtime side of things. But uh, in this case, we and, and with lighting, we've made the, the, the judgment for that for the games we're making for what we want to provide as an engine team to the their gameplay team and or to the production team, um, that that's that's how we're going to go about approaching these problems. I think a follow-up question was, do you stand up lossy work-alikes work alongside consumers of the final bake just for iteration? I mean, I think our general approach has been accept old data, right? You know, for long-running processes like navigation or lighting, we just continue along with the old data until the new data is, is ready and use that as much as possible. So, But do we have any cases where we are doing sort of a lossy version as as the more expensive thing is baking. Yeah, well, not in that sense, not in the JPEG blurry sense, but for example, uh, the game always thinks that it's loading from ideally laid out data. Like we pretend that it is, right? And we try to manufacture this data on the file storage server that we have. So the game thinks it is loading from an optimal archive layout at all times, which means that the game has just one thing to care about. It's not going to be as fast as if it was on hardware and fully laid out perfectly. But you know, PCs with SSDs are pretty fast, so we can fake it. So, you know, it is a preview of how the game will stream, right? We don't have two different ways of loading things, but I don't know if we're doing it in the asset space, really. No, I think in general we've tried to keep development and retail 
fairly consistent. We don't want assets to suddenly be different when you're running from a retail environment or something like that, because that tends to make development a lot harder. It, it sounds like, oh, it would be nice if I could have these textures or something quicker. I mean, texture compression is a good example of this. It's, it's slow to make a BC7, and we don't really have an answer to making it faster. It's just something that you have to put up with, because what's the alternative? The alternative is you either get a higher quality or a lower quality approximation. If you're an artist making tweaks, maybe you look at that and you think it's great. You think it doesn't look good, um, and then once you get the full bake of the data, it's totally different. Um, so in general, we try to avoid that sort of thing. Okay. Um, so how do you handle cash invalidation slash asset migrations as development com commences on the pipeline? So I think the heart of this question is really about, um, um, you know, as formats change, really, um, you know, maybe even as you move from one game to another, right? How do you move things forward? And how do you make sure that doesn't inhibit sort of development? Well, I mean, I can speak to the engine part of that, and maybe you can do the build system part of it. But on the engine side of things, or, or like how we manage our branches, everything is a separate swim lane. So if we were to go off this afternoon and start a new game, we'd have our own swim lane, like its own, its own branch, and we could destroy whatever we want in there. And like, we're not going to pollute the build data cache of any other project or anything. And we have, you know, like I guess most engines, you can bump a version format, and the engine will refuse to load anything older than that. And, you know, we can do that in isolation. But of course, there, it has efficiency trade-offs if we do that too much. Uh, if we keep bumping formats, then we're going to be doing nothing but rebuilding things. Right. Well, we also have format upgraders, right? We have, so we have a script mm -hmm. that it will take any asset for up to the next format, and that's all underneath the hood as far as the... And yeah, and that is very nice. And that's something I urge every engine developer to invest in. If you don't have this, if you don't have a way to make fixes to broken source data and automatically update it without user intervention, you should look into that because it is pretty sweet. Ours is slow and clunky, but it does wonders. You know, we're able to go back to four-year-old source data and, and, oh, it's a scalar field that should have allowed multiple choices. It doesn't. We can fix that, and we can roll it out and automate. And the next time someone checks it in, it'll be checked in at the new version. But we can just live with old source data. So it's very nice. Yeah, in terms of the built data, um, so what Andreas was talking about was for source data. We don't do that sort of upgrade script with the built data. We just completely throw it out. And that's part of the build system's job, is to keep track of what are the versions of built data you have. and if they don't match what the engine is expecting, then toss them out, build new ones. One of the things that we haven't talked about at all is the cache system itself, right? So um, I think, I mean, can you sort of tell us well, how, that, how does that work? I mean, everybody's not always building everything locally, right? Yeah, definitely. That would be very inefficient. So um, we have a cache system. And based on what the dependencies might be for your built file, we try to go to the cache and get an appropriate file. I mentioned earlier that we don't know, so it's not 100% whether we can get the correct file from the cache or not, but we try to get the best file that we think exists there. And then once we pull it down, look at its dependencies uh, and check those to make sure that they actually match what you have. Um, so what that means is that you can modify a file and um, you know maybe like say you modify a model or something the build system will go uh, figure out what zones it has to build and um, build those locally but if you just sync a model then somebody else has probably built it it'll go get the correct versions from the cache Jonathan did you have anything to add in terms of sort of the cache invalidation problem in the built in the data space I don't have anything to add all right. Um, one other one other question that we had was basically comes down to um, everyone. You know, I think a really common challenge is you have so much data um, that it's hard to fit it on your hard drive. Like full stop. Like you're building, you know, terabytes of data um, and just managing that on individual drives and, and you know for development processes is hard now become a hard problem. Um, so how do we approach that? Well, we're trying to be selective about what people have to have on their hard drives, but we don't have a perfect answer yet. Like I think in the, uh, the, you know, 
I think we, back in the simpler days, everyone had everything, and ev anyone could make any change to anything and expect it to work. We're quickly moving out of that space to where, if you're an audio designer, you may have all the audio source files. If you're an animator, you may have a select set of motion capture data and things that, you know, it's very task-oriented. I think that's where we are now, wouldn't you say that that's fair? Like, we exclude things from uh, people's workspaces and that sort of thing. I think, I don't know what the next frontier is, but the next frontier has to be maybe even down to the individual task level, right? I'm working on this particular asset. You figure out what I need. And at that point, you know, the SSDs on our machines are basically caches for some other humongous data store somewhere. Um, I know some engines have taken steps along these directions, but latency is always a concern too. You know, and we do do limited forms of data baking. Uh, well, in some cases, massive, like lighting. Uh, but a smaller one would be, you know, computing the collision geometry for a piece of the world. That may involve loading hundreds of models. Right, so done naively or poorly, a system like that could slow you down tremendously because do I have model A? No, let's go fetch it. Do I have model B? Probably not great. So there's a there's definitely a, a conflict there between wanting to make those local edits to the game, whatever that means to different people, and I, I can't fit it on my drive. Um, One of the complexities, I think, added complexities of, of drive space and cost, right, is that you want that to be as fast as possible, that access to be as fast as possible. So, um, you know, one of the things we transitioned to a while back was SSDs, right? So we've, in fact, made the problem harder for ourselves by saying we've picked the most expensive way of, of increasing the space, right? Right, and we, we picked a, it's like a designer drug that keeps you feeling great for a few more years before you die. Like, it's that... <laughs> <laughs> You know, it's because because two terabytes of SSD is way more expensive than one terabyte, and the prices are not going down at the rate you would hope. So, uh, and everything climbs up with the the giant data size, right? The network speeds aren't really increasing, so just sinking all that data. Right. Okay. So, did you, I want to give each of you a chance to add one last word in terms of how we manage our build data. So, Jonathan, start with you. One last word. <coughs> I think uh, I, I think we have a system that is working well and scaling well. And like like we said, the, the multiple swim lanes, the the, the even even uh, if you bump an asset version locally, uh, you can populate the cache. It won't um, the the built data cache. It won't invalidate anyone else's data. And it means that you can check that code change in that that bumps the version. And the data can come down to other people who then get that code, build that code, and, and need that version. So we have, um, I, I think, um, we have something that is running reliably and uh, predictably. And I do think that the, the challenges for us are, are, are definitely on the, the scaling side. That, as you say, um, bigger hard drives are expensive, network speeds aren't going down. Just the time it takes to process tens or hundreds of thousands of files is... Uh, not expected to improve at, at an order of magnitude scale there. So there's there's some interesting challenges in the space that, that, that I, I I think I look forward to us taking on. All right. <laughs> so Bob? that's my final thought. Bob? Um, one of the things I appreciate about our setup is that it keeps things very isolated. I mean, as programmers, we're working on the builders quite often, making changes. And it, it's set up in a way that that will never break production. Um, it, you know, we, you can say, oh, just bump a version whenever you make a change, but inevitably somebody will forget. Um, similarly, you could check in an asset that is just completely wrong, and that doesn't break production, um, unless, of course, you're working on production branch. But uh, for the most part, it's set up so that even if you do that, you can roll back, and if everybody had just sank that asset that's broken, they'll, they sync the newer fixed version very quickly, they're back to working. And so keeping production going and not getting in their way is very important for our setup. Yeah, I think so. And the, the benefits of having one thing to maintain, like one set of rules, you know, one set of loading pipelines, one set of data transfer pipelines, one set of builder pipelines, not having umpteen different systems, like, oh, here's the one I'm using when I'm quickly iterating, here's the one I'm data baking with, and here's the one that I'm... Like, it, it goes nowhere quick. Uh, you, you're going to pay so much maintenance cost to support something like that. All right, thank you, guys. <laughs>